Hi, my name is Mike Butts, and I'm the editor of Canvas, a Northeast Ohio arts magazine published by the Cleveland Jewish News. For our fall 2017 issue, I had the pleasure of meeting and writing about Cleveland artist Darius Stewart. For that article, we visited the East Cleveland neighborhood in which he grew up, as well as University Circle, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Cleveland Institute of Art. We also stopped by Mocha Cleveland, where at the time, Darius had a piece called Baggage Claim, prominently displayed in the museum's summer group exhibition, Constant as the Sun. Turns out that piece was a precursor to a larger body of work, also called Baggage Claim, which has been on view for the past two months at Dragonian and Company inside 78th Street Studios. This deeply personal exhibition features about a dozen new works as well as past several works, including paintings, prints, and drawings. With me today inside Dragonian Company to discuss the show is the artist himself, Darius Stewart. Darius, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate that. Uh, from what I recall from our chat last fall, uh, you had been working on some new pieces when you got some of the worst news someone could ever receive. Yeah. Can you uh, share with me again what that was and, and discuss how it, it uh, inspired and the, the work in the show? Um, well, what happened was my mom passed um, December 1st. Um, she had passed in 2016. So um, from that happening, kind of started this whole new idea of baggage claim. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about her life and thinking about what she had to endure and go through and all the weight that she must have had to carry um, to raise three kids on her own and to, you know, kind of work as hard as she did. So for me, it was kind of, if I could visually see how that would look, how would it, you know, how would it be depicted? Um, so that's where the idea of baggage claim came from. It's just kind of thinking of how people would approach um, everyday life or how would they look if they actually physically carried the weight or the baggage, so to speak, that one walks around with. Um, and that, that change, um that you almost immediately started working on these pieces after that, is that right? Yeah, you know, I, it, I did a few immediately and then, you know, kind of thought about it and, you know, just took a little bit of time to kind of deal with the whole situation before I went back at actually um, kind of working. Mm -hmm. Because, quite honestly, there's a few things that I'm doing in these paintings that I haven't done before. Mm -hmm. um, so, for me, it was just kind of trying to reevaluate what really mattered mm -hmm. in this particular body to me, mm -hmm. um, and and just the best ways of approach, like what material to use, you know, what how much detail to put in one aspect of versus the next. Mm -hmm. So for for me, it was just kind of decision making and giving myself proper time to kind of air that out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it makes sense. And, and the piece of mocha was the beginning of that, and then it, it led to yes, more. yes. So I, I actually have. The small studies in the work that I did leading up to that movie piece. In the front part of the gallery over there, um, there's one particular piece that um, is a picture of my wife, and it has like these, I don't want to say three, to like I'm looking in the work as I'm talking to you, but like four pieces of four bags mm -hmm. that's behind her um, as she's kind of like shedding this weight. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I made that piece, I was thinking of my mom and probably how I must have felt partially when she got the news of her passing. You know, this idea that maybe finally I'll get to breathe a little bit, you know? So this let these bags go is kind of like this way of kind of shedding the weight gradually as time went. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first piece that I kind of came up with, with the idea of um, covering up one of their large walls that had a mocha. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece, which is like this majority greenish blue color over there with my son holding the sign and my wife holding my, my new child, Emily. So um, that was kind of another thought for the first one. That's kind of more of a square. Mm -hmm. um, so all those pieces on that area is kind of pieces that were leading up to um, figuring out exactly how I wanted to approach the Mocha wall. So the change in color or the simplifying the color, making it certain, you know, certain colors was to think about the time restraints, but also what colors would be meaningful in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, 
And knowing that I wasn't going to go full color and mix, mm -hmm. you know, every color I used, to, I used a ton of colors. Mm -hmm. On a, I wasn't going to do it at that scale. It was kind of, okay, so how do I pare it down mm -hmm. and still get the maximum effect out mm -hmm. of it? And from my past experience at land, I realized that full color, you know, mixing every color, then using tempera paint, which I didn't use a lot. Um, I quickly understood that it'd be best to simplify. Mm -hmm. So you know, so those, that whole series was there, kind of me hashing out those ideas and uh, you know trying to figure out how they look best. Mm -hmm. And so obviously. Um, from for her to inspire an entire show, your mother played an important role in your life. Will you discuss a little bit uh, that role that she played? My mom is what got me started to make art to begin with. Um, she, I, I was telling my wife this just yesterday, believe it or not. Um, she actually sat down with me and um, was showing me how to color better. You know, so because we had a project in elementary, and I can remember it, I was doing doing cloud. And I remember her outlining the clouds with the darker blue and showing me how I can use multiple colors to try to get more of a fluffier cloud mm -hmm. um, or not covering the whole thing. Yeah, it's like use of the white of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but then there's also the other times where she made sure I had every supply I needed, no matter what. Or, um, you know, when I was in high school, I remember getting into a Cleveland Clinic with some of my pieces and, um, just to see the, how proud she was. And you know, she she constantly made sure that if this was the one thing I was gonna be interested in, that I was gonna keep doing. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't let nothing get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. No matter what we were going through in terms of personal, you know, house or, you know, trying to struggle to keep things running or things of that sort, she still made sure I got to school and work all the time. Mm -hmm. She still made sure I had everything I needed. Um, and when no one else thought it was even worth trying, she was the one telling me to keep going. So yeah, um, she kind of really got the ball rolling with everything and made sure I stayed focused on it. Mm -hmm. um, growing up the way I, I did, we really didn't have a ton of options or like a blueprint laid out, so to speak, of what to do, what not to do, mm -hmm. um, or how to even approach anything in life. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was kind of, um, I'm going to stick to one thing that I love and I'm going to try to do it as well as I can. Mm -hmm. and, and she completely understood that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, most people try to stray you away from things like art. You know, because mm -hmm. we all know you hear the term starving artist all the time. So it's kind of like this idea of do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. But she understood that my happiness, the um, only way I was going to really succeed is if I really loved promoted it and you know, kept pushing for me to do it. Yeah, she was oh, yeah. your, your biggest cheerleader. Yeah, she was my biggest, biggest fan. Manager. Yeah, she always said she was my biggest fan. Yeah. Um, and what, another thing she used to say was, um, yeah, if I'm remembering this correctly, she used to say, I used to always say, why you keep talking about me? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you're my greatest topic. Mm -hmm. you know, like I, I have nothing else better than you to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she, Made sure I knew at all times how she felt about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, even the work in the show, the, the series of prints that I actually previously showed them at Zyga, um, at a show I had, and that was the last show she was able to go to. Mm -hmm. So those prints that I picked was prints that she really was behind and liked mm -hmm. a lot. Um, my son. She practically helped us raise him from the start. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was her her little boy, you know. That was like her getting another chance at raising me or something. Mm -hmm. um, so she really loved that show because it was all him. <laughs> you know. So I remember her walking around saying, Oh yeah, this is what this is my favorite. You gotta make me one of these ones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was the that was the last show she actually was able to go to. So I felt like it was important to actually showcase that. Work because I'm talking about her. Um, because usually I don't even like to show the same work. Um, but that was the first time in a while that I've done it. You touched on this a little bit already. Um, 
your mother's presence is felt throughout the show, but so too are your wife's and your, your two children's. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss a little bit how the different generations of your family intersect in, in these works? I often tell people that like I use my son as kind of like the stand-in for me. Um, like he is him, but he's also me at a time when I was like his age. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, I, I get to look at him and um, see these moments where these things that happen in his gesture or the way he thinks or, you know, like I feel like I, I almost do like a flashback in my head where I can, man, that reminds me of something that, mm -hmm. you know, I experienced at that time where this feels very relevant, this moment, mm -hmm. you know, so I try to record or capture those moments and, and then I, you know, change things about them alter it a little bit so that it fits my, you know, what my thoughts was at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's now having a wife, looking at how she feels, looking at what she carries, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, it gives me a different appreciation for, for you know, a woman's life, mm -hmm. and, you know, how they operate and what they do from day to day. And honestly, I wanted to be someone really close to me that kind of plays the part of my because now I can see certain moments or see certain things that may occur um, in her life that I can relate to things that I may have remembered mm -hmm. with my mom. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the closeness has to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and having my first son, it was nothing better than that. Yeah. Um, so being able to see my son and see things in me for my son helps me kind of operate in, you know, and then how else can I make a younger me? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like the better, the best way to get in a younger mom mm -hmm. of myself. Yeah. Um, and now my daughter plays a whole other dynamic because she actually looks like a lot like me, yeah. you know, more than my son actually. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I get to now see this little lady, yeah. you know, grow. So having these different generations, being able to look at my wife and seeing at her age, my mom had me already. Mm -hmm. um, then my mom had three kids. Mm -hmm. So I was the last one. Mm -hmm. So like get to see where she's at and how she deals and you know, how she develops. Um, and the hats that she wears every day, it 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 allows me to then, you know, have a whole nother body of information to kind of pull from. Mm -hmm. um, so they they intersect because they mean so much to me. Um, already, but also because they're so close to me that I'm able to see it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I see the moment, you know, I can kind of, kind of record it in here. Um, so you know, and looking at her bags for one, you know, like looking at my wife's bags and knowing that I, I've been a part of this collection mm -hmm. <laughs> of these things. Yeah. But just thinking about how they mean to her and how she carries them. And sometimes I see these moments and it makes me think. You know, this reminds me of a moment with my mom, man, you know, or, you know, or I often went to my sister as well. So one of the different kids in the work is my sister's child. Okay. Um, so he's back there with the um, the two bags, I mean, the three bags, mm -hmm. and, you know, and the suitcase, the luggage. Mm -hmm. That's that's my sister's child. Yeah. So, you know, now I get to see how she deals with hers. Yeah. Um, so for me, Everyone that I have to, that I use have to have an importance for me to kind of get that out of it. Mm -hmm. If they don't have that same importance, it's hard for me to approach it. Yeah. And you've dropped little hints in, in some of your works, like when we spoke last year. I, I know you mentioned one of the first things you drew as a child with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, oh, yeah. and that's on one of the book bags. Oh, yeah. that, uh, My mom, them. believe it or not, and it, it got ruined in a flood, but we kept kept that comic book mm -hmm. oh, man, for over 10 years mm -hmm. from me making it. Um, I made one of my first things I've ever done that I feel like was like a piece of art that I made was an actual Ninja Turtle comic book that I made. Uh, and me and my mom sat down and she wrote the captions, she wrote the bubbles for me, I drew where they went, I, I drew all these characters. I think they were trying to defeat the Rat King. You know? For people that know what Ninja Turtles, you know, the villains and stuff, but I remember the whole thing. Um, 
And the, the Ninja Turtles meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, when I use those things in the work, I, I often put a superhero bag on my child. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, and I, I think about this now, being a black man growing up the way I grew up, we became fathers and we became like um, leaders of the pack, so to speak, in the house. Or you, you always hear the term like the man of the house. Mm -hmm. um, we had to wear that hat. We had to carry that weight really early. And so I always related to like the superheroes, you know, this idea that I'm, I'm just the man for the job or I'm tough enough to handle it mm -hmm. or, you know. That, that was something that I, I wanted to be, you know. He wanted to be kind of this fearless leader, mm -hmm. so to speak, like we are. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was all about putting those bags in there because that meant that that way, no matter what, he was going to be able to carry that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and no matter how he felt, yeah. he knew he was going to have to hold up his end of the obligation, you know, so to speak. So those bags for me kind of means that, hey, I still believe in this and I have some power, mm -hmm. you know, even though I'm carrying this weight or this baggage, that baggage is something that I feel like I can do, mm -hmm. you know, and I can keep it no matter how heavy it is. Um, because I believe that I could be like this hero, <laughs> you know, which I know sounds crazy, but um, as a kid, you grapple, you know, you hold on to those things. Um, when you you go to do something important. You know, I remember the little line and say, you know, would would he ever back down? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have male role models. Yeah. So the people that were really like strong and really confident and really handled what they were supposed to handle mm -hmm. were superheroes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know people like to relate to like sitcoms or TV shows where they see like the model family. Well, at a, at a young age, you don't see that. What you watch is cartoons, yeah. you know? And the cartoons that was really important to me was the action ones. Yeah. So it was, it was always about that superhero that throughout all the circumstances and all the issues came out victorious. Yeah. So, so of course, I always wanted to make sure I had gave a nod to that. It's the same with the bags here, you know? Um, I have reasons for the bags I use. Um, you mentioned the superhero, but can you tell me a little bit more about what the bags represent in the pieces that have you on them? The pieces that showcase my wife, that's kind of like the standard for my mom, right, right. Uh, they are all like handbags or purses. Mm -hmm. um, I particularly wanted to use designer purses because I thought if my mom carried the weight, it would have some class, yeah. a distinction to it. Mm -hmm. it. It will be, she will make it look good. Right. Um, and designer bags, handbags are like, you know, it, they got some that's hundreds of, you know, thousands yeah. of dollars. They yeah. got, they got some, and, but at the end it still carries weight. Yeah. It still carries things, you know, items, things that they have to keep with them. It can carry their life. It can carry their life, yeah. exactly. Um, so for me it was, these bags had to be designer. Mm -hmm. They had to be a bag that a person would carry that might go with an outfit or it might serve dual purpose, you know, because my mom was all about, you know, having form and function, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sure everything had a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the handbag, in a lot of cases, had many functions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people use handbags as defense mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, uh, weapons, mm -hmm. you know, defense mechanisms. So people, carry a handbag because they feel like it's an extension of them and how they look. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the list goes on of many reasons why women carry bags. Um, but for my mom, and to represent how I think her baggage would have. Mm -hmm. If she had to choose how her baggage would look. Yeah. You know, like if we all went to a store and was like, okay, we got to pick out our baggage yeah. that we're going to carry with us for the rest of life, how would it look? Because yeah. this is how I pictured it in my mind. Yeah. It was like, we all went somewhere and just said, okay, I gotta carry all this weight. What do I wanna put that weight in, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think my mom would say, oh yeah, I need these designer bags, yeah. you know? If I can get that Gucci, that, that, that you know, Dose Gabbana, mm -hmm. or you know, that Gucci bag, mm -hmm. let's get that, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
So for me, I think that's how I wanted to portray it. Yeah. You know, I wanted to at least get her to choose mm -hmm. what it would look like. Because our baggage, a lot of it's by choice. You know, some of it's forced on us. Yeah. But um, I, f I feel like I could at least give her the choice yeah. um, if I'm a display. You know. that to me it conveys a certain sort of grace that she probably carried or that you yes. you've described to me that she carried through yes. some challenges and oh yeah you would never see her um, in pain or mm -hmm. you'd never see her mm -hmm. have a hard time carrying that weight because to see her doing it is like this weakness mm -hmm. and that's a larger topic for I think a lot of people feel like that in the black community is like um those weaknesses can't be displayed mm -hmm. um, because once you start showing them, then yeah. you're done for. Right? Yeah. So she she never showed those weaknesses or that that sign of pressure or you know you would never know that she couldn't carry it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know it it still is very very heavy. Mm -hmm. That's why that piece there means so much to me because it's like. This grin and bear it type of thing where we're going to smile and we're going to carry this weight no matter how many bags keep coming, mm -hmm. you know. But just know that looking at that, you know that it has to be painful, mm -hmm. you know. Um, do she want you to see it like that? No. Mm -hmm. But it's still a painful thing. That's why the nails are done really, or, you know. Yeah. It's still the way I handled the, the, the pants. I wanted it to feel a little more aggressive. Uh, the drips in the arms, mm -hmm. you know. These moments, I wanted to make it feel like it was a little more um, of a dynamic mm -hmm. thing than just, you know, a bunch of bags of tomorrow. Yeah. Building off of what you just described about that one, that, that, that's part of yeah. uh, a three-part uh, series. Can you describe how the pieces work together? It's kind of like this grid and bear series. Um, I often think of myself as like a more of a chore I, I would say like a choreographer or more like a, um, a director. Mm -hmm. I feel like I kind of compose these arrangements and I think of them as like acts mm -hmm. or like pieces to a shot. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, if I was taking a picture of this like, scenario, I would want this close up yeah. to show this type of emotion. And then I want this far away one to kind of show like, look, but well, she's carrying it and she's going on with her journey. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I'm thinking on the other side, the dramatic angle, mm -hmm. you know, this other angle where you kind of have this idea of looking up, like mm -hmm. she's going to somewhere higher or somewhere different. Yeah. But, you know, that look of the hand reaching up in the face. And, you know, for me, it's those angles and those changes could tell you so much different, mm -hmm. you know, so many different things mm -hmm. about one specific scene. Yeah. So like if you're watching a movie, you know, and the way a movie would be broken down, yeah. like you can see the same thing, but they can arrange it like 20 different ways. Yeah. And every way they arrange it, it gives you a different feeling or a different emotion yeah. about what's happening. Right. And that's kind of my idea and how I decided to break down that. It's kind of like, okay, this one, you're farther away and you're watching her walk away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that it kind of starts to the next thing that I'm going to do in the future of work. Mm -hmm. But that piece kind of means it's leading off to this other mm -hmm. part, mm -hmm. you know. And that's a different viewpoint of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm closer and I'm... I'm little, so for me, looking at it from that angle, it's like, okay, when I'm watching her, and I'm a young son, yeah. watching her walk mm -hmm. away, you know, and that one is like, okay, well, this is the last time I've seen her, yeah. you know. That one's kind of like this close-up where it kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of shows that weight. It yeah. shows that close-up how I had to experience right. um, well, there, there are several bags there, so you get the idea of the full brunt, perhaps, yeah. of what she's getting. And I'm never at a higher angle than her. Mm -hmm. um, every time I want to make sure that whoever's looking at her is looking at her from like this voyeur kind of shorter, mm -hmm. farther in the distance, mm -hmm. or a little lower, to kind of put them at the position that I would do. Right. Um, so that's kind of why these arrangements are uh, such. It's kind of to 
Key is different, twisted turn a little bit. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I, I know it, it, the craziest thing is when doing these things, I'm thinking about all this stuff. Yeah. You know, and to put it up at the end is like, you don't know how people are going to approach that. Like, looking at those three in that way, I don't think people looked at it and said that. You know, oh man, I'm at the angle he would have been. Yeah. And, but for me, it's like, I feel like I'm rolling the field. Right. Like, you know, like I'm arranging these things. And I'm like, okay, now we got to go from this angle. Now we got to. And the, the, the way that it translates is always so different, I think, than the way that you decide to arrange it. Yeah. You know, and all you can do is hope that someone gets, you know, catches those subtleties. Yeah. But for me, they mean the world. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, that's why you put the work up as an artist and you walk away and you, and you say, okay, let's see how people approach it. Yeah. That's part of the beauty of it. Right? Well, certainly anybody who came here hopefully spent some time with each of these and, I hope. and, and got some, if not all, of what you uh, described because that's uh, the really moving uh, and powerful words. Thank you. In addition to the, the personal games depicted in your art, uh, especially in the show, your, your work also comments on larger societal issues. Will you elaborate on that? Well, um, well, with baggage in particular, that the whole idea of the weight that people carry is a kind of a large society, you know. I think everybody can relate to having some struggles or having some things that they hold with them or carry um, every day. I mean, the number of women that came in here that related to like that bag that's empty over there, mm -hmm. or um, just 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 the idea is that everyone carries this baggage with them, and things that are going on right now probably make some of this weight feel even heavier. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that at the end, I always want people to feel hopeful mm -hmm. and get this understanding that hey, you're not the only one doing it. You know, um, everybody has to carry this stuff. Mm -hmm. So just deal with it, you know. Keep moving on and eventually maybe you can shed some of the baggage, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But I, and I think the show was my way of kind of shedding a little bit of weight mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. um, so on, on that standpoint, it's just carrying that weight. But I think when I thought about it in, in terms of who I am, you know, as a black male um, living today, 2018, right? You know, you just think of all the weight and all the things that's just stacked up on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it, you know, when I was making some of this work, a lot of craziness was still happening, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's continuing to happen. But it's kind of one of these things where when it happens to one person, a lot of us feel it. And it, it feels like for me, I have an extra added thing now to carry along with me. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if I get stopped by the cop times, that gonna be or you know, making sure I make it home to my kids. Mm -hmm. These are things that's stressful, that weighs heavy on you, you know, more than you could ever think. Especially in my situation, it's almost like um, these, I, I don't like to call them burdens, um, but these like, you know, anchors. <laughs> it keeps trying to pull me down, so to speak, or it's just more things to kind of endure the story, the end story sound better. <laughs> you know, when you think about it from that standpoint. But at the same time, it's, I realize that society, um, and what's happening in the world actually plays a, a decent, it has a decent hand to play with what I have to hold. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I, we were just talking in my job about, you know, kind of dealing with having a non bias, um, anti racial, anti, you know, um, bias mm -hmm. type of world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we were talking about borderlands mm -hmm. and versus.
versus being like the norm. Mm-hmm. And, it, and when I was listening to them, I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, well, I'm kind of at the borderlands most of the time because mm-hmm. I really am not the standard because mm-hmm. it was never made for me to be. Yeah. Society was never made for me to be a standard. Yeah. Um, but because I have education and I have some level of success, I don't really feel like I'm accepted by half of the board of mm-hmm. yeah. you know? So that's like this other baggage that I had to carry around with me. It's yeah. like, well, I, I'm just good enough to not be looked at the same by the people that I should be looked at the same by, yeah. but the people that don't look at me the same, mm-hmm. I'm still not good enough to be looked at the same. You know, so it's almost like it needs to be another box me. So, you know, all the weight that just comes with trying to progress mm-hmm. uh, is another thing that really holds me, yeah. um, is this idea of progress and identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's the big things that I think I've tried to talk about, underlined in everything, like mm-hmm. the idea of the whiteness and the paintings. Yes. Or, in some of your older works, you, you have the, the blank signs. Yes. Can you discuss those a little bit? Well, the read the signs was an identity thing. Mm-hmm. It was basically talking about if I had, you know, a few lines or a few words to drop to someone, what would I say about me? Mm-hmm. And I realized that it's nothing I can really say to um, to change what people are going to bring to the table. Mm-hmm. And that making nothing there at all kind of says more mm-hmm. about me, but also gives more of a viewer time to say something about them yeah. and about what they bring to the table. And when they bring that, are they going to then examine why? Yeah. Um, that For me, art is communication, so I always kind of figure out or try to find ways to have a back and forth with my viewer. Yeah. Um, for me, that's very important. Like that's just to make the picture, it, because it's a such thing as like having like um, work that's too dense mm-hmm. or work that's like a one-liner. Mm-hmm. So I feel like you can walk into a group show and you can see some work and it's like it's so dense that you don't understand it and you can't really bring nothing away from it. Yeah. Um, then you can have work that's like, oh, I got it. Yeah. And then you walk away really fast. I want to be in the middle. I want you to have entrance. At entrance point, I want you to be able to get in there and grab something and then have some time to examine and think about it. Mm-hmm. That's my way of like kind of having a dialogue. Yeah. Um, so for me, those signs kind of opened up a dialogue. Mm-hmm. And it made people spend more time thinking about why the negative space was important. Mm-hmm. Um, why the white space actually was important. I mean, there are like the obvious quick thoughts of why it could be. Yeah. But for me, um, I want people to really examine the whiteness. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why the choice of so, you know, paper kind of is important yeah. to me. Because um, it's the whitest thing I've had, right? You know, um, I leave a lot of breathing room in the paint, in the paper. Mm-hmm. It, it, I leave that space because I want that conversation to still stand. Yeah. Um, so that the, the signs were like, a way of saying, okay, now approach this. Yeah. Why is this white that's breaking up this kid? Yeah. You know, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And then, okay, it's a sign too that's blank. Mm-hmm. That you know, does it mean he's voiceless? Does it mean you know? And, and by having these conversations, I think we get closer to something. Yeah. Um, well, and there are several, several examples of those yes. in the show. Yes, the prince is with for people to come and, and have that interaction. Yeah. So the series of prints, that show was entitled Scratching the Surface. Mm-hmm. And that kind of showcased these, you know, black and white renditions of the read the signs, so to speak, where, you know, my it's a whole series called If You're Too Cool, You'll Lose, mm-hmm. you know. So I think of it as my son's trying to hold the sign up, like, hey, mm-hmm. pay attention to me. You know, like, I, I'm ready now. You know, to kind of have this dialogue. It's like this idea that, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, yeah. so to speak. Uh, but at the same time, 
if you don't know what that squeaky wheel is trying to say, yeah. then what is it really getting? Yeah. You know, so that white sign is like, hey, I want to really say something, mm -hmm. but what is it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so, and then that I, I looked at a lot of Kathy Colitz, mm -hmm. you know, printmakers of that sort that kind of really had real confident, strong line work. Mm -hmm. And even when it was wrong, it still looked confident. Yeah. You know, when I look at a, a, a proportion, I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Or a line that went against the way that it should go to kind of describe the form. Mm -hmm. um, those mistakes were still done with such like confidence. Yeah. So for me to get back to that, I wanted to do straight dry plane. And I wanted to really show confident line work because mm -hmm. it's so not, confidence is there in the watercolors because I'm, I really pride myself on making as little amount of marks as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so with the, with the prints, it was kind of that same approach of like, how can I get to the meat and potatoes, yeah. you know, without doing cheap glaze mm -hmm. and, you know, doing multiple layers of acid baths mm -hmm. to get like certain grades yeah. and, you know, all the technical process things that come into printmaking, which I know sounds bad to printmakers, but mm -hmm. for me it was about saying the message yeah. and saying it at least the amount of steps as possible. Um, the immediacy makes a big deal to me, you know, it, it means a lot to me. Um, so those pieces kind of, the prints kind of played up on that. Mm -hmm. Um, show some of the, the drawing facility a little bit, but also kind of started to introduce the playground a little bit too. So I got like the monkey bars. Yeah. Um, I had like a jungle gym in one of them. Um, so that, those pieces are kind of all meant to, to talk about this journey and talk about this world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And you know, being this little kid experience in this world. Mm -hmm. And even my experience with the park wasn't always the best. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of to relate to that, but also to, to kind of bring up this point that we had something to say. Yeah. Um, so the signs are probably going to be around for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Yet another thing that stands out about the work in this show is your technical prowess. Uh, will you provide some insights into your process and the materials you use? Uh, you know what, um, to be quite honest, I just wake up and it just stare. No, I'm just playing. Um, technical. Um, I, one thing I always thought, and maybe it was because of when I first started painting, um, I, I went to Interlochen, uh, Michigan in high school, mm -hmm. and for like an art camp. Mm -hmm. It was Interlochen Art Camp. It was like this huge international mm -hmm. thing. People that was like four generations deep, like great grandfather helped found the company type thing. They're all in there, you know. And some of these people are just so, so much better technically. Mm -hmm. um, because here I am, a little black guy that just took like two years of actual drawing and, and you know, clearly school of arts, which I'm not going to say is a bad place at all. But these kids were generations deep in yeah. knowledge, you know. So for me, it was. Um, it was important to, to realize where I was going to be strong at, mm -hmm. and it had to be what I wanted to say. Because mm -hmm. I knew that was the one thing that was unique and, and you know, authentic. But what I also started to think a lot more about is ways of approaching what I want to say, mm -hmm. right? Having like this, um, I feel like you have to have these nuances, like these these moments where you can be aggressive and you know everything can fly everywhere, right? You have to have these moments where you can really be refined and more seductive with the work, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like those moments that that helps to get the moment, the ideal across, it helps to get the thought across. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I made sure that I kept working on my technical ability. So I could feel more comfortable with whatever way I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I in college I used to get to work at eight o'clock, seven thirty, and I used to draw, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. and I still do. Mm -hmm. And from there, that's why watercolor became important to me because it was like something that I could keep no matter what, mm -hmm. and you know I could pull that out of my back pocket 
and start doing some painting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then I looked at people that I thought were very great technically, mm -hmm. that, you know, didn't seem to work hard. Because <laughs> that was the catch for me. Yeah. It was not the people that labor and you seem sweat type of thing. Mm -hmm. It was the people that looked like they did it while I had a cigarette hanging out there while I was. Yeah. You know, and a, you know, a cup of wine in the other hand, you know. Those were the people I idolized. So when I think of John Singer Sargent, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind, I can just see him now, like, with a cigarette hanging, and, you know, he's just casually painting with this thing that looks like a broomstick. Yeah. You know, and somehow that mark is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember the piece that he has in the museum. And it's like this dress, I swear that dress looked like, took like three marks. Yeah. And it's like, how did you do that in three strokes? Yeah. You know, like, how did you make it so it's this variation of lights and darks, and I can tell the, 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 you know, the form, and I can tell how it sits on the leg, mm -hmm. with these three, four strokes. Um, so it's like the economy of brush strokes, mm -hmm. or the economy, you know, like, being, being, you know, really thoughtful with every mark, so it was intentional, it was there. These were the things that I kept holding up high in terms of like successful technically. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about hiding the marks. Yeah. Um, so people like the David never was really important to me mm -hmm. because it's like I don't want to not see it. Yeah. Um, but I want a person that does understand it to see it and say, wow. You know? Mm -hmm. Like how did he manage to pull that off? Mm -hmm. You know, so I started playing around with not only painting but can I mix to the point that I can dip in the paint and I get two or three colors of certain parts of the brush that I want. Mm -hmm. So when I make a mark now you can see three different things. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, you know, I started thinking about all these different ways of approach. I started looking at, you know, I tell my students all the time, watch YouTube. Mm -hmm. You know? So I started looking at how artists who approach paintings. Um, or how they approach drawings. So that's why I studied Kathy Colowitz. Mm -hmm. I wanted to really see and I can honestly feel like I can see how her arm moved. Mm -hmm. You know, it got to the point where I could actually feel like her arm must have did this here, mm -hmm. you know? And I used to copy those movements, you know? I would look at a, a brush stroke from Sargent and actually feel like I could copy the direction and the speed mm -hmm. to get that drawback at the end, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so for me, the technical prowess kind of started to build in those moments, mm -hmm. you know? But also, the confidence, I feel like, is the key. Because mm -hmm. I make a lot of marks that, for the most, you know, timid person probably wouldn't dare. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so all my paintings are done with the biggest possible brush I can find mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. I don't bring out small brushes often, yeah. you know, and I intentionally do it. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Painting in here, part of it for me was the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, being able to paint around a crowd. Um, also kind of bringing them into the world a little bit, showing them kind of how I operate. Yeah. So during Third Fridays here at yeah. Sunday Night Street Studios, you were... Yeah, so I did this. a number of these paintings. Um, some of them, you know, small, but I, I had like bags mm -hmm. that I was doing like little bag paintings, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and. What I was doing was kind of going through how I, how I work, um, showing the process, showing from sketch to the creation, you know, um, how quick I go by sketching. So one of the things I noticed that watercolor artists, or some of them, I don't want to point people out, sure. but so scared, mm -hmm. you know, it's this idea that if the water drips one centimeter past the line I made, I'm screwed. So what I did was I stopped making a lot of lines. <laughs> if I don't have a lot of lines, then I don't have to worry about keeping it contained. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those restrictions are useless. Mm -hmm. um, also, this, this idea of um, working laying flat. Um, I've seen a lot of people that I kind of like, I used to look at it in awe, you know? Because they would be working on this big piece of paper and it'd be straight up. Mm -hmm. And here it is, they had such mastery over the water that they didn't concern themselves with how that water was going to react because they knew. Yeah. So for me, it's putting those problems in front of me, putting up those issues and 
seeing how good can I adapt and how good can I negotiate with the pain. Um, I believe in the watercolor being itself, you know. Um, I believe in truth to material, mm -hmm. you know. The, I want the watercolor to move. I want it to have its breath, you know. I want it to be fluid and have these translucent layers. Like, you know, I want to hold true to what it is. Mm -hmm. So like, that whole pain by numbers approach doesn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, the land flat stops the water from moving. Um, I use um, this paper, which is you puddle a lot because how it puddles. Mm -hmm. So for me, it wasn't just, can I work on a piece of regular watercolor up, you know, upright? Yeah. That didn't do it for me. I wanted to see now, can I do something where it puddles? Can I keep that puddle mm -hmm. and contain it? Yeah. So sometimes when I'm working out, I'll hit a spot here and I'll, I will know like, okay, it's going to last for this long. Mm -hmm. And why it's happening, I'm over here. And then I'll look and I'm like, okay, I can stop. Mm -hmm. You know, and for me it's like this, this dance and I, I really take pride in um, constantly trying to improve. Because I keep thinking about how it interlocking. Man, I was like a fish out of water yeah. looking at those other artists. Um, so, you know, I figured if it's something that I'm gonna love and I'm gonna dump, jump into, mm -hmm. I wanna feel like I got it, you yeah. know? And if not, I'm gonna keep working on feeling like I got it. Yeah. Um, I'm not nearly where I wanna be, but um, I feel confident anytime I sit down and work. Um, and I think that's the key, where right? right. I I don't have a lot of time. A lot of it is just out of um, me having less amount of time to actually create. I wake where everybody sleep. I always tell people this. I don't sleep. You know, I have two kids. I have a wife. They all need time with me. I don't know why. I don't know why they like spending so much time with me. But when they're asleep, so I, you know, I'm laying my daughter down. Now I'm looking at my son. I'm saying, okay, he's asleep. And my wife actually stayed up, and she was a trooper, because she stayed up through this whole body of work. She mm -hmm. literally was up with me almost every night. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't know it, but she used to fall asleep, and then I'll go back up. <laughs> you know, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, she'll fall asleep, and I'm like, okay, cool. Now I can really work. Mm -hmm. um, so, a lot of it is out of time. I want to be able to control and be able to understand what my medium and how the approach will be, mm -hmm. because my time has to happen yeah. really quickly. I don't have the luxury to, oh, I'm going to paint this one section of this bag this week. Mm -hmm. No, those bags had to happen like now, mm -hmm. you know? So being able to understand what the water is going to do and how it's going to operate and me being able to let it do its thing mm -hmm. actually helps the success rate. It helps the speed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, and then out of, you know, my constraints at home, I don't have a big, you know, six foot wide, six foot long table that sits upright and lays down flat that I can spin around and, you know, all these other contraptions that artists use. So I have a nice easel. I made like two big pieces of wood. I put them together, clap the work down to it, and that's how I'm able to work on bigger pieces. Um, so for me, it's, it's dealing with what you got. I, I mean, I love it, so I'm gonna make it no matter what. So, for me, it's kind of trying to find out. Okay, so how do I achieve the 60-inch painting? Yeah. Okay, yeah, get some wood. Yeah. You know, lay it on this wood. Um, I can't lay it flat. It's upo. If I lay on it too much, I might mess something up. So, okay, sit it upright. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's simple. Simple solutions. And for other people that don't know about watercolor, they're like. How on earth can you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you feel like this is all you had to do, or if you feel like this is what you had to do, you would do it too. Yeah. It's just making it that urgency and making it that mean that much for you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, a lot of my technical prowess is just honestly going at it and thinking it through. Like, I think, I tell my wife I'm working all the time, mm -hmm. you know? I'm thinking about how I'm approach those pens on that painting uh, a week before I actually sat down and approached those pens. Yeah. So I already knew, like, okay, I'm going to take this type of tool to this part, I'm going to scrape with this, I'm going to lay down these layers first, and I'm going to go back. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like so for me, it's it's already here. Mm -hmm. So I think the the actual time that it takes to make it becomes so much shorter. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what Sergeant did. You mm -hmm. know, I feel like Sergeant actually knew how to approach it already. So the actual act of making the marks was so much easier, mm -hmm. and he could do it so much faster. Yeah. Because it was like, hey, I already know how to approach it. Yeah. Um, I'm not that smart yet in painting. <laughs> so I have to think about it a lot longer. I'm sure for him that thought process was quicker. But um, a lot of my work happened like one day, mm -hmm. two days, because it's already so thought out yeah. that I even know what I'm going to work on first, second, third, fourth, what color I'm going to put down next. And when I sit down a mix, which I was showing people here, I have all my colors kind of laid out. Mm -hmm. You know, I have how I'm going to mix step by step in my head. Yeah. So the approach becomes simpler. Um, I often tell my students that um, the difference between me and them is just I have thought about it so much more. Yeah. You know, like the mistakes that they're going to make, I've made them here. Like three times already. Mm -hmm. So it's like chess game, mm -hmm. you know? Like I'm already making those moves here. So when that goes to the paper, it's already a done deal. Mm -hmm. And my mom, now it's just can I execute it yeah. efficiently and quick, you know? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always happen, but you know, that's the part of the game, right? Um, I hope that helped. <laughs> to talk about technical. I truthfully, you know, technical uh, application has been haunting me because my teacher um, in college, he told me, he said this word facility. Mm -hmm. He's like, you have a great facility. And he used it like as a, like, yeah, so what? Mm -hmm. You know, almost type of thing. And it's like, well, damn, I kind of really care about it, you know? But he said it to kind of get me to keep fighting through and keep working on getting better at it. And now, he controlled this material to say. Yeah. So I went from tar. I used tar. I've used mm -hmm. some of the messiest crap. Uh, you know, then when people see me using this paper, they're like, how in the world are you going to paint on something that's like plastic? Mm -hmm. And all it does is puddle. You make two marks on the same area while it's wet. The other mark just comes up. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like all these other levels of issues. And I'm sure I'm going to find other ways of making it harder on myself. Because mm -hmm. that, for me, is the way of getting better technical. Well, Darius, thanks for taking some time to uh, sit down and talk with me about your show. Thank you for joining us as well. Uh, if you missed Darius' show at Tregonian and Company, don't worry. He's scheduled to have a solo show uh, in fall of 2018 at the Canton Museum of Art. In the meantime, be sure to pick up a copy of Canvas at a gallery or a newsstand near you. Our current issue has Lakewood artist Lane Cooper on the cover, and our next issue is scheduled to publish in April of 2018. Thanks again, and please remember, support local art.